let us know. Ready? Okay, cool. All right, guys, we're live. AMA number two. It's exciting. Dr. Natoli, and this is Dr. Schultz. <laughs> we are Functional Spine and Sport located in Libertyville, which is north of Chicago, uh, about 30, 40 minutes. And uh, we're excited to be here and just answer questions for muscle, joint, and nerve problems. These are very common, but un you're very commonly misdiagnosed as well. Um, so, you know, we pride our clinic on basically helping patients that have had pain for longer than six months, have already seen three or more providers, done a bunch of treatments, and still just not getting any relief. So that's typically who we help the most. Um, so we just take a lot of pride in that. But we also want to want to share this information with you guys so you know how to better navigate healthcare and know what questions to ask and be a better advocate for yourself. Um, so we have four really good questions today, and then we'll take some live questions as well. If anybody's watching, you know, just drop one in and uh, they'll track it and let us know at the end. So Dr. Schultz. Yeah, so the first question is a great question. I'm actually surprised we didn't get this on our first one because this is what we specialize in. Or maybe they follow our information and kind of know what it is. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But it's, so what we treat in our office is adhesion and nerve entrapment, so that's what we specialize in. And the first question is, what is adhesion made of? Which is an awesome question. Uh, so what adhesion is made of is, is really thick connective tissue like collagen. And it sticks your muscles together and makes your muscles weaker and less flexible. So if you think of this stuff like really thick pieces of glue that's laying down in your muscles from overuse or an injury or poor posture, It'll start relatively small, but just build and build and build and build on itself until it creates a really big problem. So that leads to, you know, weakness, pain, limited ranges of motion, and it can even start to beat up the joints that, it, that it's around or compress into disc and cause degeneration. Uh, so that's what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. The, and the biggest, earliest indicators you know you'll have adhesion is you start to lose flexibility around a joint. So say it's your shoulder, you know, it'll only come up to here, or you're trying to touch your toes and you can only go so far. And you've tried stretching consistently, you've tried rolling consistently, you've even maybe tried yoga, um, Ramwad, some of those uh, programs that are out there, and you're really not seeing any sustainable changes. Like you feel loose for a little bit and it goes right back to square one, and or maybe even gets worse a little bit over time. That's your earliest indicator for adhesion. So you don't have to have pain right away. The loss of function is always a window into what's gonna happen next. So your range of motion is a window into your function as well. So that's something to look out for uh, when you're maybe suspecting you might have adhesion as your problem. Yeah, and to kind of go off of that, some of those other treatments that have not worked in the past for you and someone's been telling you that they have been treating your adhesion, what's really happening is there kind of moving that adhesion around. So they're, you know, massaging it or trying to just not break it down basically. So the analogy we use in the office is, how would you break a rubber band? <clears throat> would you step on a rubber band and rub it around? No, you snap it and pull it apart. So that's what we do with the adhesion is we put tension onto it and that's what breaks down the adhesion and gets your body to move better and ultimately gets you out of pain. Yeah. And the best providers to find somebody that knows how to do that are in integrative diagnosis providers. You can go on integrativediagnosis.com slash find a provider and search your area to see if you can find a muscle adhesion nerve entrapment specialist in your area uh, that can help you. And if you have any other questions on that end, you know, feel free to shoot us a message and we'll try to help you out there. Yeah. Uh, then the second question really piggybacks on this one is what happens to the adhesion after it's broken down? Um, so I'll go ahead and answer that one too, I guess. Cool. Uh, so the simple version is once the treatment breaks the connection of adhesion between the muscle is our immune system will actually dissolve those products and then we waste or we flush them out through our lymphatic system. Yeah. So that's so if you if we remove this linkage, this spot that's stuck together, and now it's off of that. You know, I erased it there, but you would have little bits of it now free floating because now it's not stuck in there. So now your immune system has, you can imagine Pac-Man, everybody kind of knows that game, and I'm not a great artist, but this Pac-Man's close enough. He's going to go around and he or she is going to go around and start chewing this stuff up. So that's what's going to clean it up. There's macrophages, basically the technical term for that, that go around and clean that up. 
and remove that. So I think that covers that question yeah, pretty well. Yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty basic, but yeah. it doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. This one's gonna be a little bit more in depth. So the, the question was, what's the difference between tendinitis and tendinosis? We talk about tendinosis a lot because it's what creates pain in, in, for people that have had tendon problems for longer than, say, a couple weeks or recurring tendon problems. Um, but often it's just mislabeled as tendinitis and then they're treated as that and it doesn't really get better. So we're really talking about the tendon itself. So the connective tissue that we're talking about is, so muscle, so we'll use my forearm for example, the muscle conjoins into a tendon and then the tendon attaches to the bone and that's what transmits force through the joint, okay? So this is much thicker, denser tissue, there's less blood flow than there is in muscles and it just takes a lot more force than muscles. So it can get beat up for a long time with zero symptoms because there's less blood flow and less nerve supply and then it can deg uh, degrade and degenerate and break down. So that's kind of the process. So that distinguishes tendonitis being your initial kind of inflammatory phase, the itis part portion of it. So high load to a tendon, say you go from not running at all or not doing any CrossFit and then you're like, okay, I wanna get in there and I'm motivated and you go and do it every, every day of the week you could get tendonitis in your in your tendons and if you cut back or rest or you know maybe cut it 50 percent for a week or two it goes away and it never comes back you don't even have to treat it you could even just ice it for a little bit or do nothing and it would go away on its own this itis portion can fluctuate in and out if the tendons also degraded so the tendinosis is a degenerative process that gradually starts to break down and accumulate tissue over time. So it thickens, it gets disorganized, it gets weaker, and it becomes even less flexible and there's less blood flow. So think of the analogy of cooked spaghetti and uncooked spaghetti. So the uncooked spaghetti would be like this, straight and smooth and parallel. Cooked spaghetti looks like this, it's a mess in there, and it, and it can become painful, but it doesn't have to be. So if you have tendinosis, and then you have a, a bout of inflammation or itis because you did too much on it and the doctor just treats your tendonitis, that shuts off your pain, you keep using it, the tendinosis keeps get, gradually getting worse and worse and worse. This can cause ruptures, this can cause other tears, this can cause other problems in the muscles and it's just a, it's just a nightmare. So the difference is very, very important as far as the diagnosis is concerned because that completely changes your treatment and completely changes your outcome. Yeah, and, and something you can you know, look for at home or even think, I've been told I have tennis elbow or um, another common Jumper's knee. Jumper's or knee or even you know, really tight focal hamstring pain really high up into your glute. With runners, yeah you're probably on this side of that problem where the tendon's actually starting to break down and weaken. So if you're getting treated for an itis and it's an osis instead, you need to find someone else that understands that problem and can unload the tendon and get any other problem taken care of in that area so that tendon can actually heal. Because the cool thing about tendons when they do start to degrade like this is they can regenerate. So mm -hmm. these fibers can actually re-parallel themselves and get stronger again and get stable again. Mm -hmm. as long as they're not completely torn through. So you still have a really good window of opportunity to get better if it's caught soon enough. So an early indicator for tendinosis is it's, a, it's uncomfortable or painful when you're first warming up, it tends to go away. And then depending on how much work you put into it, whether it's work or activity or exercise, it gets a little bit worse later that day or the next morning. So those are your early indicators for how that feels. Achilles is a good example, like you talked about, the elbow, the knee, the bottom of the plantar foot where they have plantar fasciitis. Um, those, are, those are common places where you're gonna get tendinosis. Again, just uncomfortable, painful first thing, warms up a little bit, and then becomes painful later on. So, and then as it gets worse, as like he's saying, as this problem degrades, it's starting to become more constant and more frequent um, and more intense. 
So I think we beat that horse to death. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if your tendonitis is not getting better, it's because it's tendinosis, and we can fix that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a question come in. It says, is treatment painful? It depends. You know, if your problem has a lot of inflammation and if it's degraded quite a bit and we have to break down adhesion or free up nerve entrapments around the area, it can be. It's certainly not anywhere close to as painful as the with condition that you're living with yeah, currently. With it, yeah, so that's never a detractor for people that have had care with us. So if they just want results and, you know, it's short-term discomfort yeah. or long-term results. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, very good question. Yeah. Side effect is soreness, but... Yeah, yeah, otherwise very safe, yep. and durable, and effective. Absolutely. So the the final question we have is, someone was come to, uh, asking about their right foot turning out when they walk, and it's actually starting to make their knee hurt. So mm -hmm. how can they change that, basically? So what we're going to do is actually demonstrate what this would look like. Yeah, because this is a complicated question with a lot of moving parts. And essentially what they're saying is their foot turns into maybe like a duck walk. So it starts to go like this. Um, I'm going to try to move this table out of the way so I can demo this <clears throat> to try to show this. This could be a, actually a problem stemming from the hip joint um, or the knee, but it's essentially you need to have this broken down by an expert. But one of the common reasons we see the foot start to turn out as you walk, if the hip is supposed to be lined up like this, in the hip joints, either you got a malformation, you know, a congenital shape change, or it starts to degrade over time. It's going to unload itself by rotating. As it rotates to unload the hip, your foot turns out, and you start to walk with that duck foot. What's the what happens often is that you'll get medial knee pain because then there's a lot of stress on the inside of the knee as you rotate the foot out. So my arm is a good example here too. It should be straight, but if you're walking and your foot starts to go like this because your joint up here, your, your shoulder, or your hip joint rather, is starting to turn out, it's gonna affect your knee joint, which would be here. So it's very complicated because you'd have to have an expert be able to identify or test each layer of the joint, your ankle, your knee, and your hip, as well as take a detailed history to find out how long this problem's been going on, any, any other factors that could cause this, and then you know eventually unlayer this. We got another question. Uh, someone had a steroid shot. Hold that up for you. Steroid shot in the shoulder. No pain is back. Yeah, that's common. So that happens all the time. Steroid injections are not treatment for the long term. They're very short windows to relieve pain for a short time, but the pain always comes back and it often comes back worse. So if you want to draw, you know, symptoms dysfunction, a good way to look at it is this. If you have zero problems down here on this x-axis, and the y-axis is how problems build up, and this is where your pain threshold is. So anything above this line is painful. Anything below this line, you don't feel at all. So as your problem builds up in your shoulder, you may have all these layers to problems, and the injection may only take off the top of the inflammation, which would then give you a window into making like, oh, I feel Hey, okay, everything's great. However, if you go back to loading it, whether it was exercise or just normal usage, it's not fixed. So the pain is going to come back. The inflammation is just a byproduct of dysfunction, essentially. So injections are really never a good option because they just mask things and eventually they do wear off and eventually the problem gets worse. So that's you know, a good, good question because you're not told that by the doctors, but it's just normal. It yeah. just happens. Yeah, and a good analogy to use for that is if you if your check engine light came on in your car and you just put a piece of tape over it and ignore it, your car is going to break down fairly quickly and cost you a lot of money instead of saying, yeah. okay, let's take it to the mechanic, let's figure out the problem. It could be relatively cheap and it could be a bad light bulb or it could be something big that you want to get fixed. Yeah. So you don't want to do that to your body. You can always buy a new car. You can't buy a new body. <laughs> so you better take care of the one you live in. Yeah. And the other thing too, with injections into tendons, research is very clear on this. It degrades the tendons and, and again, it can make them worse over time and more often than not does. And it can actually lead to tears early. So um, again, most people are not told these facts leading into that. They're just, mm -hmm. okay, well, this is your problem. We're gonna inject it and like, bye-bye. So yeah. unfortunate, but that's kind of the status of healthcare, but you don't have to 
deal with that if you don't want to. There's other options out there for you. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. something we see, you know, pretty much on a daily or weekly basis. New patients come in and they've had injections or shots and it's just hasn't worked because it's not fixing their actual diagnosis. You can, you know, if you can think back when we talked about the tendinosis versus tendinitis, the diagnosis matters. So the yeah. diagnosis absolutely matters and when is a cortisone injection the right thing? And it looks like we've got one more question coming in here. So we'll wait to see what that is and see if we can answer it. To Appreciate the you guys uh, shooting questions to us and, and tuning in. This is great. We're having a good time. Why doesn't PT work? Um, I think I understand where your question's coming from. And the the it's not whether it works or not. It's whether you're whether you've been diagnosed correctly and that was the treatment you needed. So PT works great if the PT understands your problem and, and can address that problem. Just like our treatment works great if we can identify your problem and fix that problem. If it doesn't fit what we do, our treatment doesn't work, right? Correct. Just like surgery can work great if you need surgery. So it really just depends on your diagnosis. However, you have to find a provider that knows how to diagnose and that's the biggest pitfall that we run into and that's why we're integrated diagnosis providers because that's the only system that's taught musculoskeletal conservative doctors how to diagnose fully and how to respect all these things that we're talking about today and then how to treat adhesion and nerve entrapment which is so common. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the PT was wrong per se, it's that they just didn't have your problem figured out so that's why the treatment itself didn't work. Yeah. You always have to ask the question why. So you know when you think of traditional PT it's stretch and strengthen. So why is my body part type, why is my body part weak? Until you can figure out those whys, then you can perform treatment. Right. A lot of time people have that completely flipped. It's, you've got a weak low back, let's strengthen it instead of right. why do you have a weak low back? And same thing along with the cortisone. It's like it's inflamed, let's inject it, knock down the inflammation. Why is it all beat up and why is it all inflamed? Exactly. So, so that's, I mean, again, these are great questions and not, and not many people have even heard of these things, so uh, thank you. And that's what we like to do is figure out the why. Yeah. That's our, that's our favorite part. <clears throat> All right. All right, thanks for watching and yeah. stay tuned for number three. See you guys. Thanks.